international short stories volume three french stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by bruce peary international short stories volume three french stories compiled and translated by francis j reynolds quasi part one by alfred de musset one at the beginning of the reign of louis the fifteenth a young man named croisille son of a goldsmith was returning from paris to havre his native town he had been entrusted by his father with the transaction of some business and his trip to the great city having turned out satisfactorily the joy of bringing good news caused him to walk the sixty leagues more gaily and briskly than was his wont for though he had a rather large sum of money in his pocket he travelled on foot for pleasure he was a good-tempered fellow and not without wit but so very thoughtless and flighty that people looked upon him as being rather weak-minded his doublet buttoned awry his periwig flying to the wind his hat under his arm he followed the banks of the seine at times finding enjoyment in his own thoughts and again indulging in snatches of song up at daybreak supping at wayside inns and always charmed with this stroll of his through one of the most beautiful regions of france plundering the apple-trees of normandy on his way he puzzled his brain to find rhymes for all these rattle-pates are more or less poets and tried hard to turn out a madrigal for a certain fair damsel of his native place she was no less than a daughter of a fermier general mademoiselle godeau the pearl of havre a rich heiress and much courted croisille was not received at monsieur godeau's otherwise than in a casual sort of way that is to say he had sometimes himself taken there articles of jewellery purchased at his father's monsieur godeau whose somewhat vulgar surname ill-fitted his immense fortune avenged himself by his arrogance for the stigma of his birth and showed himself on all occasions enormously and pitilessly rich he certainly was not the man to allow the son of a goldsmith to enter his drawing-room but as mademoiselle godeau had the most beautiful eyes in the world and croisille was not ill-favoured and as nothing can prevent a fine fellow from falling in love with a pretty girl croisille adored mademoiselle godeau who did not seem vexed thereat thus was he thinking of her as he turned his steps toward havre and as he had never reflected seriously upon anything instead of thinking of the invincible obstacles which separated him from his lady-love he busied himself only with finding a rhyme for the christian name she bore mademoiselle godeau was called julie and the rhyme was found easily enough so croisy having reached honfleur embarked with a satisfied heart his money and his madrigal in his pocket and as soon as he jumped ashore ran to the paternal house he found the shop closed and knocked again and again not without astonishment and apprehension for it was not a holiday but nobody came he called his father but in vain he went to a neighbor's to ask what had happened instead of replying the neighbor turned away as though not wishing to recognize him Quasi repeated his questions he learned that his father his affairs having long been in an embarrassed condition had just become bankrupt and had fled to america abandoning to his creditors all that he possessed not realizing as yet the extent of his misfortune Quasi felt overwhelmed by the thought that he might never again see his father it seemed to him incredible that he should be thus suddenly abandoned he tried to force an entrance into the store but was given to understand that the official seals had been affixed so he sat down on a stone and giving way to his grief began to weep piteously deaf to the consolations of those around him never ceasing to call his father's name though he knew him to be already far away at last he rose ashamed at seeing a crowd about him and in the most profound despair turned his steps towards the harbour 
on reaching the pier he walked straight before him like a man in a trance who knows neither where he is going nor what is to become of him he saw himself irretrievably lost possessing no longer a shelter no means of rescue and of course no longer any friends alone wandering on the seashore he felt tempted to drown himself then and there just at the moment when yielding to this thought he was advancing to the edge of a high cliff an old servant named jean who had served his family for a number of years arrived on the scene ah my poor jean he exclaimed you know all that has happened since i went away is it possible that my father could leave us without warning without farewell he is gone answered jean but indeed not without saying good-bye to you at the same time he drew from his pocket a letter which he gave to his young master quasi recognized the handwriting of his father and before opening the letter kissed it rapturously but it contained only a few words instead of feeling his trouble softened it seemed to the young man still harder to bear honorable until then and known as such the old gentleman ruined by an unforeseen disaster the bankruptcy of a partner had left for his son nothing but a few commonplace words of consolation and no hope except perhaps that vague hope without aim or reason which constitutes it is said the last possession one loses jean my friend you carried me in your arms said croisi when he had read the letter and you certainly are to-day the only being who loves me at all it is a very sweet thing to me but a very sad one for you for as sure as my father embarked there i will throw myself into the same sea which is bearing him away not before you nor at once but some day i will do it for i am lost what can you do replied jean not seeming to have understood but holding fast to the skirt of croisi's coat what can you do my dear master your father was deceived he was expecting money which did not come and it was no small amount either could he stay here i have seen him sir as he made his fortune during the thirty years that i served him i have seen him working attending to his business the crown pieces coming in one by one he was an honorable man and skilful they took a cruel advantage of him within the last few days i was still there and as fast as the crowns came in i saw them go out of the shop again your father paid all he could for a whole day and when his desk was empty he could not help telling me pointing to a drawer where but six francs remained there were a hundred thousand francs there this morning that does not look like a rascally failure sir there is nothing in it that can dishonor you i have no more doubt of my father's integrity answered croisi than i have of his misfortune neither do i doubt his affection but i wish i could have kissed him for what is to become of me i am not accustomed to poverty i have not the necessary cleverness to build up my fortune and if i had it my father is gone it took him thirty years how long would it take me to repair this disaster much longer and will he be living then certainly not he will die over there and i cannot even go and find him i can join him only by dying utterly distressed as croisi was he possessed much religious feeling although his despondency made him wish for death he hesitated to take his life at the first words of this interview he had taken hold of old jean's arm and thus both returned to the town when they had entered the streets and the sea was no longer so near it seems to me sir said jean that a good man has a right to live and that a misfortune proves nothing since your father has not killed himself thank god how can you think of dying since there is no dishonor in his case and all the town knows it is so what would they think of you that you felt unable to endure poverty it would be neither brave nor christian for at the very worst what is there to frighten you there are plenty of people born poor and who have never had either mother or father to help them on 
i know that we are not all alike but after all nothing is impossible to god what would you do in such a case your father was not born rich far from it meaning no offence and that is perhaps what consoles him now if you had been here this last month it would have given you courage yes sir a man may be ruined nobody is secure from bankruptcy but your father i make bold to say has borne himself through it all like a man though he did leave us so hastily but what could he do it is not every day that a vessel starts for america i accompanied him to the wharf and if you had seen how sad he was how he charged me to take care of you to send him news from you sir it is a right poor idea you have that throwing the helve after the hatchet every one has his time of trial in this world and i was a soldier before i was a servant i suffered severely at the time but i was young i was of your age sir and it seemed to me that providence could not have spoken his last word to a young man of twenty-five why do you wish to prevent the kind god from repairing the evil that has befallen you give him time and all will come right if i might advise you i would say just wait two or three years and i will answer for it you will come out all right it is always easy to go out of this world why will you seize an unlucky moment while jean was thus exerting himself to persuade his master the latter walked in silence and as those who suffer often do was looking this way and that as though seeking for something which might bind him to life as chance would have it at this juncture mademoiselle godot the daughter of the fermier general happened to pass with her governess the mansion in which she lived was not far distant quasi saw her enter it this meeting produced on him more effect than all the reasonings in the world i have said that he was rather erratic and nearly always yielded to the first impulse without hesitating an instant and without explanation he suddenly left the arm of his old servant and crossing the street knocked at monsieur godot's door two when we try to picture to ourselves nowadays what was called a financier in times gone by we invariably imagine enormous corpulence short legs a gigantic wig and a broad face with a triple chin and it is not without reason that we have become accustomed to form such a picture of such a personage every one knows to what great abuses the royal tax farming led and it seems as though there were a law of nature which renders fatter than the rest of mankind those who fatten not only upon their own laziness but also upon the work of others m godot among financiers was one of the most classical to be found that is to say one of the fattest at the present time he had the gout which was nearly as fashionable in his day as the nervous headache is in ours stretched upon a lounge his eyes half closed he was coddling himself in the coziest corner of a dainty boudoir the panel mirrors which surrounded him majestically duplicated on every side his enormous person bags filled with gold covered the table around him the furniture the wainscot the doors the locks the mantelpiece the ceiling were gilded so was his coat i do not know but that his brain was gilded too he was calculating the issue of a little business affair which could not fail to bring him a few thousand louis and was even deigning to smile over it to himself when quasi was announced the young man entered with a humble but resolute air and with every outward manifestation of that inward tumult with which we find no difficulty in crediting a man who is longing to drown himself m godot was a little surprised at this unexpected visit then he thought his daughter had been buying some trifle and was confirmed in that thought by seeing her appear almost at the same time with the young man he made a sign to quasi not to sit down but to speak 
the young lady seated herself on a sofa and quasi remaining standing expressed himself in these terms sir my father has failed the bankruptcy of a partner has forced him to suspend his payments and unable to witness his own shame he has fled to america after having paid his last sou to his creditors i was absent when all this happened i have just come back and have known of these events only two hours i am absolutely without resources and determined to die it is very probable that on leaving your house i shall throw myself into the water in all probability i would already have done so if i had not chanced to meet at the very moment this young lady your daughter i love her from the very depths of my heart for two years i have been in love with her and my silence until now proves better than anything else the respect i feel for her but to-day in declaring my passion to you i fulfil an imperative duty and i would think i was offending god if before giving myself over to death i did not come to ask you mademoiselle julie in marriage i have not the slightest hope that you will grant this request but i have to make it nevertheless for i am a good christian sir and when a good christian sees himself come to such a point of misery that he can no longer suffer life he must at least to extenuate his crime exhaust all the chances which remain to him before taking the final and fatal step at the beginning of this speech m godeau had supposed that the young man came to borrow money and so he prudently threw his handkerchief over the bags that were lying around him preparing in advance a refusal and a polite one for he always felt some good will toward the father of quasi but when he had heard the young man to the end and understood the purport of his visit he never doubted one moment that the poor fellow had gone completely mad he was at first tempted to ring the bell and have him put out but noticing his firm demeanour his determined look the fermier general took pity on so inoffensive a case of insanity he merely told his daughter to retire so that she might be no longer exposed to hearing such improprieties while quasi was speaking mademoiselle godeau had blushed as a peach in the month of august at her father's bidding she retired the young man making her a profound bow which she did not seem to notice left alone with quasi m godeau coughed rose then dropped again upon the cushions and trying to assume a paternal air delivered himself to the following effect my boy said he i am willing to believe that you are not poking fun at me but you have really lost your head i not only excuse this proceeding but i consent not to punish you for it i am sorry that your poor devil of a father has become bankrupt and has skipped it is indeed very sad and i quite understand that such a misfortune should affect your brain besides i wish to do something for you so take this stool and sit down there it is useless sir answered quasi if you refuse me as i see you do i have nothing left but to take my leave i wish you every good fortune and where are you going to write to my father and say good-bye to him eh the devil anyone would swear you were speaking the truth i'll be damned if i don't think you are going to drown yourself yes sir at least i think so if my courage does not forsake me that's a bright idea fie on you how can you be such a fool sit down sir i tell you and listen to me m godeau had just made a very wise reflection which was that it is never agreeable to have it said that a man whoever he may be threw himself into the water on leaving your house he therefore coughed once more took his snuff-box cast a careless glance upon his shirt frill and continued it is evident that you are nothing but a simpleton a fool a regular baby you do not know what you are saying you are ruined that's what has happened to you but my dear friend all that is not enough one must reflect upon the things of this world if you came to ask me well good advice for instance i might give it to you but what is it you are after you are in love with my daughter 
yes sir and i repeat to you that i am far from supposing that you can give her to me in marriage but as there is nothing in the world but that which could prevent me from dying if you believe in god as i do not doubt you do you will understand the reason that brings me here whether i believe in god or not is no business of yours i do not intend to be questioned answer me first where have you seen my daughter in my father's shop and in this house when i brought jewellery for mademoiselle julie who told you her name was julie what are we coming to great heavens but be her name julie or javat do you know what is wanted in any one who aspires to the hand of the daughter of a fermier general no i am completely ignorant of it unless it is to be as rich as she something more is necessary my boy you must have a name well my name is quasi your name is quasi poor wretch do you call that a name upon my soul and conscience sir it seems to me to be as good a name as godot you are very impertinent sir and you shall rue it indeed sir do not be angry i had not the least idea of offending you if you see in what i said anything to wound you and wish to punish me for it there is no need to get angry have i not told you that on leaving here i am going straight to drown myself although m godeau had promised himself to send quasi away as gently as possible in order to avoid all scandal his prudence could not resist the vexation of his wounded pride the interview to which he had to resign himself was monstrous enough in itself it may be imagined then what he felt at hearing himself spoken to in such terms listen he said almost beside himself and determined to close the matter at any cost you are not such a fool that you cannot understand a word of common sense are you rich no are you noble still less so what is this frenzy that brings you here you come to worry me you think you are doing something clever you know perfectly well that it is useless you wish to make me responsible for your death have you any right to complain of me do i owe a son to your father is it my fault that you have come to this mon dieu when a man is going to drown himself he keeps quiet about it that is what i am going to do now i am your very humble servant one moment it shall not be said that you had recourse to me in vain there my boy here are three louis d'or go and have dinner in the kitchen and let me hear no more about you much obliged i am not hungry and i have no use for your money so quasi left the room and the financier having set his conscience at rest by the offer he had just made settled himself more comfortably in his chair and resumed his meditations mademoiselle godeau during this time was not so far away as one might suppose she had it is true withdrawn in obedience to her father but instead of going to her room she had remained listening behind the door if the extravagance of quasi seemed incredible to her still she found nothing to offend her in it for love since the world has existed has never passed as an insult on the other hand as it was not possible to doubt the despair of the young man mademoiselle godeau found herself a victim at one and the same time to the two sentiments most dangerous to women compassion and curiosity when she saw the interview at an end and quasi ready to come out she rapidly crossed the drawing-room where she stood not wishing to be surprised eavesdropping and hurried towards her apartment but she almost immediately retraced her steps the idea that perhaps quasi was really going to put an end to his life troubled her in spite of herself scarcely aware of what she was doing she walked to meet him the drawing-room was large and the two young people came slowly towards each other quasi was as pale as death and mademoiselle godeau vainly sought words to express her feelings in passing beside him she let fall on the floor a bunch of violets which she held in her hand 
he at once bent down and picked up the bouquet in order to give it back to her but instead of taking it she passed on without uttering a word and entered her father's room quasi alone again put the flowers in his breast and left the house with a troubled heart not knowing what to think of his adventure three scarcely had he taken a few steps in the street when he saw his faithful friend jean running towards him with a joyful face what has happened he asked have you news to tell me yes replied jean i have to tell you that the seals have been officially broken and that you can enter your home all your father's debts being paid you remain the owner of the house it is true that all the money and all the jewels have been taken away but at least the house belongs to you and you have not lost everything i have been running about for an hour not knowing what had become of you and i hope my dear master that you will now be wise enough to take a reasonable course what course do you wish me to take sell this house sir it is all your fortune it will bring you about thirty thousand francs with that at any rate you will not die of hunger and what is to prevent you from buying a little stock in trade and starting business for yourself you would surely prosper we shall see about this answered quasi as he hurried to the street where his home was he was eager to see the paternal roof again but when he arrived there so sad a spectacle met his gaze that he had scarcely the courage to enter the shop was in utter disorder the rooms deserted his father's alcove empty everything presented to his eyes the wretchedness of utter ruin not a chair remained all the drawers had been ransacked the till broken open the chest taken away nothing had escaped the greedy search of creditors and lawyers who after having pillaged the house had gone leaving the doors open as though to testify to all passers-by how neatly their work was done this then exclaimed quasi is all that remains after thirty years of work and a respectable life and all through the failure to have ready on a given day money enough to honor a signature imprudently given while the young man walked up and down given over to the saddest thoughts jean seemed very much embarrassed he supposed that his master was without ready money and that he might perhaps not even have dined he was therefore trying to think of some way to question him on the subject and to offer him in case of need some part of his savings after having tortured his mind for a quarter of an hour to try and hit upon some way of leading up to the subject he could find nothing better than to come up to quasi and ask him in a kindly voice sir do you still like roast partridges the poor man uttered this question in a tone at once so comical and so touching that quasi in spite of his sadness could not refrain from laughing and why do you ask me that said he my wife replied jean is cooking me some for dinner sir and if by chance you still like them quasi had completely forgotten till now the money which he was bringing back to his father jean's proposal reminded him that his pockets were full of gold i thank you with all my heart said he to the old man and i accept your dinner with pleasure but if you are anxious about my fortune be reassured i have more money than i need to have a good supper this evening which you in your turn will share with me saying this he laid upon the mantel four well-filled purses which he emptied each containing fifty louis although this sum does not belong to me he added i can use it for a day or two to whom must i go to have it forwarded to my father sir replied jean eagerly your father especially charged me to tell you that this money belongs to you and if i did not speak of it before it was because i did not know how your affairs in paris had turned out where he has gone your father will want for nothing he will lodge with one of your correspondents who will receive him most gladly he has moreover taken with him enough for his immediate needs for he was quite sure of still leaving behind more than was necessary to pay all his just debts all that he has left sir is yours 
he says so himself in his letter and i am especially charged to repeat it to you that gold is therefore legitimately your property as this house in which we are now i can repeat to you the very words your father said to me on embarking may my son forgive me for leaving him may he remember that i am still in the world only to love me and let him use what remains after my debts are paid as though it were his inheritance those sir are his own expressions so put this back in your pocket and since you accept my dinner pray let us go home the honest joy which shone in jean's eyes left no doubt in the mind of quasi the words of his father had moved him to such a point that he could not restrain his tears on the other hand at such a moment four thousand francs were no bagatelle as to the house it was not an available resource for one could realize on it only by selling it and that was both difficult and slow all this however could not but make a considerable change in the situation the young man found himself in so he felt suddenly moved shaken in his dismal resolution and so to speak both sad and at the same time relieved of much of his distress after having closed the shutters of the shop he left the house with jean and as he once more crossed the town could not help thinking how small a thing our affections are since they sometimes serve to make us find an unforeseen joy in the faintest ray of hope it was with this thought that he sat down to dinner beside his old servant who did not fail during the repast to make every effort to cheer him heedless people have a happy fault they are easily cast down but they have not even the trouble to console themselves so changeable is their mind it would be a mistake to think them on that account insensible or selfish on the contrary they perhaps feel more keenly than others and are but too prone to blow their brains out in a moment of despair but this moment once passed if they are still alive they must dine they must eat they must drink as usual only to melt into tears again at bedtime joy and pain do not glide over them but pierce them through like arrows kind hot-headed natures which know how to suffer but not how to lie through which one can clearly read not fragile and empty like glass but solid and transparent like rock crystal after having clinked glasses with jean quasi instead of drowning himself went to the play standing at the back of the pit he drew from his bosom mademoiselle godot's bouquet and as he breathed the perfume in deep meditation he began to think in a calmer spirit about his adventure of the morning as soon as he had pondered over it for a while he saw clearly the truth that is to say that the young lady in leaving the bouquet in his hands and in refusing to take it back had wished to give him a mark of interest for otherwise this refusal and this silence could only have been marks of contempt and such a supposition was not possible quasi therefore judged that mademoiselle godot's heart was of a softer grain than her father's and he remembered distinctly that the young lady's face when she crossed the drawing-room had expressed an emotion the more true that it seemed involuntary but was this emotion one of love or only of sympathy or was it perhaps something of still less importance mere commonplace pity had mademoiselle godot feared to see him die him quasi or merely to be the cause of the death of a man no matter what man although withered and almost leafless the bouquet still retained so exquisite an odor and so brave a look that in breathing it and looking at it quasi could not help hoping it was a thin garland of roses round a bunch of violets what mysterious depths of sentiment an oriental might have read in these flowers by interpreting their language but after all he need not be an oriental in this case the flowers which fall from the breast of a pretty woman in europe as in the east are never mute 
were they but to tell what they have seen while reposing in that lovely bosom it would be enough for a lover and this in fact they do perfumes have more than one resemblance to love and there are even people who think love to be but a sort of perfume it is true the flowers which exhale it are the most beautiful in creation while croisilles mused thus paying very little attention to the tragedy that was being acted at the time mademoiselle godeau herself appeared in a box opposite the idea did not occur to the young man that if she should notice him she might think it very strange to find the would-be suicide there after what had transpired in the morning he on the contrary bent all his efforts towards getting nearer to her but he could not succeed a fifth-rate actress from paris had come to play merope and the crowd was so dense that one could not move for lack of anything better quasi had to content himself with fixing his gaze upon his lady-love not lifting his eyes from her for a moment he noticed that she seemed preoccupied and moody and that she spoke to every one with a sort of repugnance her box was surrounded as may be imagined by all the fops of the neighbourhood each of whom passed several times before her in the gallery totally unable to enter the box of which her father filled more than three-fourths quasi noticed further that she was not using her opera glasses nor was she listening to the play her elbows resting on the balustrade her chin in her hand with her far-away look she seemed in all her sumptuous apparel like some statue of venus disguised en marquise the display of her dress and her hair her rouge beneath which one could guess her paleness all the splendour of her toilet did but the more distinctly bring out the immobility of her countenance never had quasi seen her so beautiful having found means between the acts to escape from the crush he hurried off to look at her from the passage leading to her box and strange to say scarcely had he reached it when mademoiselle godeau who had not stirred for the last hour turned round she started slightly as she noticed him and only cast a glance at him then she resumed her former attitude whether that glance expressed surprise anxiety pleasure or love whether it meant what not dead or god be praised there you are living i do not pretend to explain be that as it may at that glance quasi inwardly swore to himself to die or gain her love end of quasi part one by alfred de musset international short stories volume three french stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by bruce peary international short stories volume three french stories compiled and translated by francis j reynolds quasi part two by alfred de musset four of all the obstacles which hinder the smooth course of love the greatest is without doubt what is called false shame which is indeed a very potent obstacle quasi was not troubled with this unhappy failing which both pride and timidity combined to produce he was not one of those who for whole months hover round the woman they love like a cat round a caged bird as soon as he had given up the idea of drowning himself he thought only of letting his dear julie know that he lived solely for her but how could he tell her so should he present himself a second time at the mansion of the fermier general it was but too certain that m godeau would have him ejected julie when she happened to take a walk never went without her maid it was therefore useless to undertake to follow her to pass the nights under the windows of one's beloved is a folly dear to lovers but in the present case it would certainly prove vain 
i said before that quasi was very religious it therefore never entered his mind to seek to meet his lady-love at church as the best way though the most dangerous is to write to people when one cannot speak to them in person he decided on the very next day to write to the young lady his letter possessed naturally neither order nor reason it read somewhat as follows mademoiselle tell me exactly i beg of you what fortune one must possess to be able to pretend to your hand i am asking you a strange question but i love you so desperately that it is impossible for me not to ask it and you are the only person in the world to whom i can address it it seemed to me last evening that you looked at me at the play i had wished to die would to god i were indeed dead if i am mistaken and if that look was not meant for me tell me if fate can be so cruel as to let a man deceive himself in a manner at once so sad and so sweet i believe that you commanded me to live you are rich beautiful i know it your father is arrogant and miserly and you have a right to be proud but i love you and the rest is a dream fix your charming eyes on me think of what love can do when i who suffer so cruelly who must stand in fear of everything feel nevertheless an inexpressible joy in writing you this mad letter which will perhaps bring down your anger upon me but think also mademoiselle that you are a little to blame for this my folly why did you drop that bouquet put yourself for an instant if possible in my place i dare think that you love me and i dare ask you to tell me so forgive me i beseech you i would give my life's blood to be sure of not offending you and to see you listening to my love with that angel smile which belongs only to you whatever you may do your image remains mine you can remove it only by tearing out my heart as long as your look lives in my remembrance as long as the bouquet keeps a trace of its perfume as long as a word will tell of love i will cherish hope having sealed his letter quasi went out and walked up and down the street opposite the godot mansion waiting for a servant to come out chance which always serves mysterious loves when it can do so without compromising itself willed it that mademoiselle julie's maid should have arranged to purchase a cap on that day she was going to the milliner's when quasi accosted her slipped a louis into her hand and asked her to take charge of his letter the bargain was soon struck the servant took the money to pay for her cap and promised to do the errand out of gratitude quasi full of joy went home and sat at his door awaiting an answer before speaking of this answer a word must be said about mademoiselle godot she was not quite free from the vanity of her father but her good nature was ever uppermost she was in the full meaning of the term a spoilt child she habitually spoke very little and never was she seen with a needle in her hand she spent her days at her toilet and her evenings on the sofa not seeming to hear the conversation going on around her as regards her dress she was prodigiously coquettish and her own face was surely what she thought most of on earth a wrinkle in her collarette an ink spot on her finger would have distressed her and when her dress pleased her nothing can describe the last look which she cast at her mirror before leaving the room she showed neither taste nor aversion for the pleasures in which young ladies usually delight she went to balls willingly enough and renounced going to them without a show of temper sometimes without motive the play wearied her and she was in the constant habit of falling asleep there when her father who worshipped her proposed to make her some present of her own choice she took an hour to decide not being able to think of anything she cared for when monsieur godot gave a reception or a dinner it often happened that julie would not appear in the drawing-room and at such times she passed the evening alone in her own room in full dress walking up and down her fan in her hand if a compliment was addressed to her she turned away her head and if any one attempted to pay court to her 
she responded only by a look at once so dazzling and so serious as to disconcert even the boldest never had a sally made her laugh never had an air in an opera a flight of tragedy moved her indeed never had her heart given a sign of life and on seeing her pass in all the splendor of her nonchalant loveliness one might have taken her for a beautiful somnambulist walking through the world as in a trance so much indifference and coquetry did not seem easy to understand some said she loved nothing others that she loved nothing but herself a single word however suffices to explain her character she was waiting from the age of fourteen she had heard it ceaselessly repeated that nothing was so charming as she she was convinced of this and that was why she paid so much attention to dress in failing to do honor to her own person she would have thought herself guilty of sacrilege she walked in her beauty so to speak like a child in its holiday dress but she was very far from thinking that her beauty was to remain useless beneath her apparent unconcern she had a will secret inflexible and the more potent the better it was concealed the coquetry of ordinary women which spends itself in ogling in simpering and in smiling seemed to her a childish vain almost contemptible way of fighting with shadows she felt herself in possession of a treasure and she disdained to stake it piece by piece she needed an adversary worthy of herself but too accustomed to see her wishes anticipated she did not seek that adversary it may even be said that she felt astonished at his failing to present himself for the four or five years that she had been out in society and had conscientiously displayed her flowers her furbelows and her beautiful shoulders it seemed to her inconceivable that she had not yet inspired some great passion had she said what was really behind her thoughts she certainly would have replied to her many flatterers well if it is true that i am so beautiful why do you not blow your brains out for me an answer which many other young girls might make and which more than one who says nothing hides away in a corner of her heart not far perhaps from the tip of her tongue what is there indeed in the world more tantalizing for a woman than to be young rich beautiful to look at herself in her mirror and see herself charmingly dressed worthy in every way to please fully disposed to allow herself to be loved and to have to say to herself i am admired i am praised all the world thinks me charming but nobody loves me my gown is by the best maker my laces are superb my coiffure is irreproachable my face the most beautiful on earth my figure slender my foot prettily turned and all this helps me to nothing but to go and yawn in the corner of some drawing-room if a young man speaks to me he treats me as a child if i am asked in marriage it is for my dowry if somebody presses my hand in a dance it is sure to be some provincial fop as soon as i appear anywhere i excite a murmur of admiration but nobody speaks low in my ear a word that makes my heart beat i hear impertinent men praising me in loud tones a couple of feet away and never a look of humbly sincere adoration meets mine still i have an ardent soul full of life and i am not by any means only a pretty doll to be shown about to be made to dance at a ball to be dressed by a maid in the morning and undressed at night beginning the whole thing over again the next day that is what mademoiselle godeau had many times said to herself and there were hours when that thought inspired her with so gloomy a feeling that she remained mute and almost motionless for a whole day when Quasi wrote her, she was in just such a fit of ill-humour. She had just been taking her chocolate and was deep in meditation, stretched upon a lounge, when her maid entered and handed her the letter with a mysterious air. She looked at the address, and, not recognising the handwriting, fell again to musing. The maid then saw herself forced to explain what it was, 
which she did with a rather disconcerted air not being at all sure how the young lady would take the matter mademoiselle godeau listened without moving then opened the letter and cast only a glance at it she at once asked for a sheet of paper and nonchalantly wrote these few words no sir i assure you i am not proud if you had only a hundred thousand crowns i would willingly marry you such was the reply which the maid at once took to croisille who gave her another louis for her trouble five a hundred thousand crowns are not found in a donkey's hoof-print and if croisille had been suspicious he might have thought in reading mademoiselle godeau's letter that she was either crazy or laughing at him he thought neither for he only saw in it that his darling julie loved him and that he must have a hundred thousand crowns and he dreamed from that moment of nothing but trying to secure them he possessed two hundred louis in cash plus a house which as i have said might be worth about thirty thousand francs what was to be done how was he to go about transfiguring these thirty-four thousand francs at a jump into three hundred thousand the first idea which came into the mind of the young man was to find some way of staking his whole fortune on the toss-up of a coin but for that he must sell the house croisy therefore began by putting a notice upon the door stating that his house was for sale then while dreaming what he would do with the money that he would get for it he awaited a purchaser a week went by then another not a single purchaser applied more and more distressed croisy spent these days with jean and despair was taking possession of him once more when a jewish broker rang at the door this house is for sale sir is it not are you the owner of it yes sir and how much is it worth thirty thousand francs i believe at least i have heard my father say so the jew visited all the rooms went upstairs and down into the cellar knocking on the walls counting the steps of the staircase turning the doors on their hinges and the keys in their locks opening and closing the windows then at last after having thoroughly examined everything without saying a word and without making the slightest proposal he bowed to croisille and retired croisille who for a whole hour had followed him with a palpitating heart as may be imagined was not a little disappointed at this silent retreat he thought that perhaps the jew had wished to give himself time to reflect and that he would return presently he waited a week for him not daring to go out for fear of missing his visit and looking out of the windows from morning till night but it was in vain the jew did not reappear jean true to his unpleasant role of adviser brought moral pressure to bear to dissuade his master from selling his house in so hasty a manner and for so extravagant a purpose dying of impatience ennui and love croisy one morning took his two hundred louis and went out determined to tempt fortune with this sum since he could not have more the gaming-houses at that time were not public and that refinement of civilization which enables the first comer to ruin himself at all hours as soon as the wish enters his mind had not yet been invented scarcely was croisy in the street before he stopped not knowing where to go to stake his money he looked at the houses of the neighborhood and eyed them one after the other striving to discover suspicious appearances that might point out to him the object of his search a good-looking young man splendidly dressed happened to pass judging from his mien he was certainly a young man of gentle blood and ample leisure so croisy politely accosted him sir he said i beg your pardon for the liberty i take i have two hundred louis in my pocket and i am dying either to lose them or win more could you not point out to me some respectable place where such things are done at this rather strange speech the young man burst out laughing upon my word sir answered he if you are seeking any such wicked place you have but to follow me for that is just where i am going croisy followed him and a few steps farther they both entered a house of very attractive appearance 
where they were received hospitably by an old gentleman of the highest breeding several young men were already seated round a green cloth quasi modestly took a place there and in less than an hour his two hundred louis were gone he came out as sad as a lover can be who thinks himself beloved he had not enough to dine with but that did not cause him any anxiety what can i do now he asked himself to get money to whom shall i address myself in this town who will lend me even a hundred louis on this house that i cannot sell while he was in this quandary he met his jewish broker he did not hesitate to address him and featherhead as he was did not fail to tell him the plight he was in the jew did not much want to buy the house he had come to see it only through curiosity or to speak more exactly for the satisfaction of his own conscience as a passing dog goes into a kitchen the door of which stands open to see if there is anything to steal but when he saw quasi so despondent so sad so bereft of all resources he could not resist the temptation to put himself to some inconvenience even in order to pay for the house he therefore offered him about one-fourth of its value quasi fell upon his neck called him his friend and saviour blindly signed a bargain that would have made one's hair stand on end and on the very next day the possessor of four hundred new louis he once more turned his steps toward the gambling-house where he had been so politely and speedily ruined the night before on his way he passed by the wharf a vessel was about leaving the wind was gentle the ocean tranquil on all sides merchants sailors officers in uniform were coming and going porters were carrying enormous bales of merchandise passengers and their friends were exchanging farewells small boats were rowing about in all directions on every face could be read fear impatience or hope and amidst all the agitation which surrounded it the majestic vessel swayed gently to and fro under the wind that swelled her proud sails what a grand thing it is thought quasi to risk all one possesses and go beyond the sea in perilous search of fortune how it fills me with emotion to look at this vessel setting out on her voyage loaded with so much wealth with the welfare of so many families what joy to see her come back again bringing twice as much as was entrusted to her returning so much prouder and richer than she went away why am i not one of those merchants why could i not stake my four hundred louis in this way this immense sea what a green cloth on which to boldly tempt fortune why should i not myself buy a few bales of cloth or silk what is to prevent my doing so since i have gold why should this captain refuse to take charge of my merchandise and who knows instead of going and throwing away this my little all in a gambling-house i might double it i might triple it perhaps by honest industry if julie truly loves me she will wait a few years she will remain true to me until i am able to marry her commerce sometimes yields greater profits than one thinks examples are not wanting in this world of wealth gained with astonishing rapidity in this way on the changing waves why should providence not bless an endeavour made for a purpose so laudable so worthy of his assistance among these merchants who have accumulated so much and who send their vessels to the ends of the world more than one has begun with a smaller sum than i have now they have prospered with the help of god why should i not prosper in my turn it seems to me as though a good wind were filling these sails and this vessel inspires confidence come the die is cast i will speak to the captain who seems to be a good fellow i will then write to julie and set out to become a clever and successful trader the greatest danger incurred by those who are habitually but half crazy is that of becoming at times altogether so the poor fellow without further deliberation put his whim into execution to find goods to buy when one has money and knows nothing about the goods is the easiest thing in the world 
the captain to oblige quasi took him to one of his friends a manufacturer who sold him as much cloth and silk as he could pay for the whole of it loaded upon a cart was promptly taken on board quasi delighted and full of hope had himself written in large letters his name upon the bales he watched them being put on board with inexpressible joy the hour of departure soon came and the vessel weighed anchor six i need not say that in this transaction quasi had kept no money in hand his house was sold and there remained to him for his sole fortune the clothes he had on his back no home and not a sou with the best will possible jean could not suppose that his master was reduced to such an extremity quasi was not too proud but too thoughtless to tell him of it so he determined to sleep under the starry vault and as for his meals he made the following calculation he presumed that the vessel which bore his fortune would be six months before coming back to havre quasi therefore not without regret sold a gold watch his father had given him and which he had fortunately kept he got thirty-six livres for it that was sufficient to live on for about six months at the rate of four sous a day he did not doubt that it would be enough and reassured for the present he wrote to mademoiselle godeau to inform her of what he had done he was very careful in his letter not to speak of his distress he announced to her on the contrary that he had undertaken a magnificent commercial enterprise of the speedy and fortunate issue of which there could be no doubt he explained to her that la fleurette a merchant vessel of one hundred and fifty tons was carrying to the baltic his cloths and his silks and implored her to remain faithful to him for a year reserving to himself the right of asking later on for a further delay while for his part he swore eternal love to her when mademoiselle godeau received this letter she was sitting before the fire and had in her hand using it as a screen one of those bulletins which are printed in seaports announcing the arrival and departure of vessels and which also report disasters at sea it had never occurred to her as one can well imagine to take an interest in this sort of thing she had in fact never glanced at any of these sheets the perusal of croisie's letter prompted her to read the bulletin she had been holding in her hand the first word that caught her eye was no other than the name of la fleurette the vessel had been wrecked on the coast of france on the very night following its departure the crew had barely escaped but all the cargo was lost mademoiselle godeau at this news no longer remembered that quasi had made to her an avowal of his poverty she was as heartbroken as though a million had been at stake in an instant the horrors of the tempest the fury of the winds the cries of the drowning the ruin of the man who loved her presented themselves to her mind like a scene in a romance the bulletin and the letter fell from her hands she rose in great agitation and with heaving breast and eyes brimming with tears paced up and down determined to act and asking herself how she should act there is one thing that must be said in justice to love it is that the stronger the clearer the simpler the considerations opposed to it in a word the less common sense there is in the matter the wilder does the passion become and the more does the lover love it is one of the most beautiful things under heaven this irrationality of the heart we should not be worth much without it after having walked about the room without forgetting either her dear fan or the passing glance at the mirror julie allowed herself to sink once more upon her lounge whoever had seen her at this moment would have looked upon a lovely sight her eyes sparkled her cheeks were on fire she sighed deeply and murmured in a delicious transport of joy and pain poor fellow he has ruined himself for me 
independently of the fortune which she could expect from her father mademoiselle godeau had in her own right the property her mother had left her she had never thought of it at this moment for the first time in her life she remembered that she could dispose of five hundred thousand francs this thought brought a smile to her lips a project strange bold wholly feminine almost as mad as quasi himself entered her head she weighed the idea in her mind for some time then decided to act upon it at once she began by inquiring whether quasi had any relatives or friends the maid was sent out in all directions to find out having made minute inquiries in all quarters she discovered on the fourth floor of an old rickety house a half crippled aunt who never stirred from her armchair and had not been out for four or five years this poor woman very old seemed to have been left in the world expressly as a specimen of hungry misery blind gouty almost deaf she lived alone in a garret but a gaiety stronger than misfortune and illness sustained her at eighty years of age and made her still love life her neighbors never passed her door without going in to see her and the antiquated tunes she hummed enlivened all the girls of the neighborhood she possessed a little annuity which sufficed to maintain her as long as day lasted she knitted she did not know what had happened since the death of louis the fourteenth it was to this worthy person that julie had herself privately conducted she donned for the occasion all her finery feathers laces ribbons diamonds nothing was spared she wanted to be fascinating but the real secret of her beauty in this case was the whim that was carrying her away she went up the steep dark staircase which led to the good lady's chamber and after the most graceful bow spoke somewhat as follows you have madame a nephew called quasi who loves me and has asked for my hand i love him too and wish to marry him but my father monsieur godeau fermier general of this town refuses his consent because your nephew is not rich i would not for the world give occasion to scandal nor cause trouble to anybody i would therefore never think of disposing of myself without the consent of my family i come to ask you a favor which i beseech you to grant me you must come yourself and propose this marriage to my father i have thank god a little fortune which is quite at your disposal you may take possession whenever you see fit of five hundred thousand francs at my notary's you will say that this sum belongs to your nephew which in fact it does it is not a present that i am making him it is a debt which i am paying for i am the cause of the ruin of quasi and it is but just that i should repair it my father will not easily give in you will be obliged to insist and you must have a little courage i for my part will not fail as nobody on earth excepting myself has any right to the sum of which i am speaking to you nobody will ever know in what way this amount will have passed into your hands you are not very rich yourself i know and you may fear that people will be astonished to see you thus endowing your nephew but remember that my father does not know you that you show yourself very little in town and that consequently it will be easy for you to pretend that you have just arrived from some journey this step will doubtless be some exertion to you you will have to leave your armchair and take a little trouble but you will make two people happy madame and if you have ever known love i hope you will not refuse me the old lady during this discourse had been in turn surprised anxious touched and delighted the last words persuaded her yes my child she repeated several times i know what it is i know what it is as she said this she made an effort to rise her feeble limbs could barely support her julie quickly advanced and put out her hand to help her by an almost involuntary movement they found themselves in an instant 
in each other's arms a treaty was at once concluded a warm kiss sealed it in advance and the necessary and confidential consultation followed without further trouble all the explanations having been made the good lady drew from her wardrobe a venerable gown of taffeta which had been her wedding dress this antique piece of property was not less than fifty years old but not a spot not a grain of dust had disfigured it julie was in ecstasies over it a coach was sent for the handsomest in the town the good lady prepared the speech she was going to make to monsieur godeau julie tried to teach her how she was to touch the heart of her father and did not hesitate to confess that love of rank was his vulnerable point if you could imagine said she a means of flattering this weakness you will have won our cause the good lady pondered deeply finished her toilet without another word clasped the hands of her future niece and entered the carriage she soon arrived at the godeau mansion there she braced herself up so gallantly for her entrance that she seemed ten years younger she majestically crossed the drawing-room where julie's bouquet had fallen and when the door of the boudoir opened said in a firm voice to the lackey who preceded her announce the dowager baroness de croisy these words settled the happiness of the two lovers m godeau was bewildered by them although five hundred thousand francs seemed little to him he consented to everything in order to make his daughter a baroness and such she became who would dare contest her title for my part i think she had thoroughly earned it end of quasi part two by alfred de musset